Um, my name is Jeremy McAnally. I've written a lot about op open source software. Um, this is a little bit of it. <laughs> I didn't get a sound feed, so you guys can't enjoy the experience like I can. But there is one. There is one. Blackboard, you're on the right hand side towards the back of the podium. I think I got it. Please, I have this here. Yeah. <laughs> It's in, but I'm not sure if it's. Yeah. Maybe if you. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay, that ruined the whole Rick Roll surprise there, but uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's like Rick showing. I don't know what you'd call that. But I've uh, written a couple of books. You might have seen the Mr. Averly book floating around the internet, and I can almost guarantee you none of you have seen the Ruby in Practice book because it's, it's not out yet. But it's done, and it's baking, or whatever it is they do in production. And uh, it should be out soon. And whichever one of you guys I like best can have two copies of it. I have no objective standard for deciding who gets those, but I'm told by my publisher I can give away two. So, uh, I work at ENTP with Rick Olson and Justin Palmer and Courtney Gaskin. And I organized the Ruby Hoedown and I've spoken at a few other conferences. <clears throat> um, so we're gonna be doing a talk called uh, Deep Ruby. And it's gonna be more of a meta level talk, a little bit below the level of uh, Giles' talk earlier. Uh, it's gonna be more of a talking about Ruby's object model. And I'm sure a lot of you are looking at Deep Ruby and thinking, what are you talking about? So um, I'm gonna use the, the chronicle of, Chronicles of Narnia here. Um, you know, when Aslan and Edmund are, are talking, or is that, what's the kid's name? Edmund? Yeah, yeah that's the one. Uh, they're talking, and uh, it's sort of like Jesus and the disciples. Aslan's all like deep magic, and then Edmund's all like, uh, what? <laughs> and um, <laughs> so we're going to try to answer a lot of the questions about the, the object model. If you have any questions, by the way, just raise your hand. If I don't get to you, yell at me. If I uh, still don't answer, just wave your arms wildly or throw things, and uh, I'll eventually get around to it. Um, I, I really wanted to give this talk because, well, frankly, you may or may not suck at really using objects in Ruby. And um, I, I kind of suck at it a lot of times. I don't really think about how I, I could best exploit Ruby's object model. And, uh, and we all suck. And if I was really cool, you could insert a clever spoof of you suck at Photoshop. But unfortunately, um, I, I'm not skilled with iMovie. And it defeated me. So uh, this talk's not going to be a bunch of object graphs and discussions in UML and none of that. I'm not going to abuse you with that. We're going to talk more about, um, the, I guess you could call it the flavor of Ruby. Maybe um, that, that's salt, by the way. Um, <laughs> talk more about what, what makes Ruby Ruby. You know, when someone talks about Ruby, it's like Lisp. Like, what makes a Ruby Ruby? Um, so I'm going to set up a metaphysical framework here. Um, that's sort of what we're going for. Um, that would be us. And uh, that's Ruby. So, um, so we're really going with. So let's just jump into just basics of Ruby objects. Uh, you know, we talk about objects in everyday life, things we use, shoes, for example, uh, computers, things we manipulate, objects, you know, things that exist in our space. Uh, in Ruby, everything is an object. Classes are objects, numbers are objects, objects are objects if that even makes sense. But when we talk about objects, we have all these languages that are totally object-oriented, prototype, uh, object-oriented languages, and we have all these languages that talk about having object-oriented features. And a lot of people get really confused when you start talking about objects because there are so many definitions of what makes an object. Um, in Ruby, everything is an object for real. Like, seriously, it's not lying like Python, you know, where it's like everything's an object, except we have these few little methods that just kind of mess around with objects, but they don't really belong to an object themselves. And I know there's some Ruby internals geek out there. It's like, that's not right. You are not correct. And that's true. Because in the C implementation, classes are technically not objects. They're their own struct and stuff that we don't really care about. But when we're usually using it, everything's an object because we can work with it. And so what's the difference? 
I guess in a language like C sharp, you could really think of objects as bricks. You know, you kind of have this thing, and you can't really do anything with it. You can throw it at stuff, but it itself is pretty solid. Um, in Ruby, you can more or less think of them as, as Lego bricks. And those are not Duplo blocks, for those of you who have read that, that blog entry. Uh, they're Lego bricks. And um, you can build with them, you can manipulate them, you can snap them together, work with them, compose different things with them. There's a, it's a different mindset when you're working with objects. Um, in Ruby, the, the objects are more or less defined by their behavior rather than a class, because at runtime you can change things. It's just totally dynamic behavior on the part of objects. And so it's not really like something like C Sharp where there's very little about the class or object that you're working with that you can change at runtime other than properties or uh, state related values. Um, and this behavior creates the protocols for interaction. So whereas in a language that is statically typed and strongly typed, you have your class and that's what defines what that object can do and what it can work with. Um, in Ruby, it's defined by its behavior. And so if something has a method and behaves a certain way, then it can work in that context. Um, when you work with a language like C Sharp or any of the, the statically typed object oriented languages, you get code that's a lot like a pile of Lego bricks. Um, it's broken up, it doesn't really work cohesively as well as you could if you had a little bit looser typing system. You get things like this where it's convert array to string, convert hash to string, and there's very little that you can do. And in many situations, you can use polymorphism and things like that to overcome this, but in a typical situation, everyday development, you're not going to want to build your object model around thinking, what can I do to save code? It just gets in the way when you start putting things together. In Ruby, on the other hand, you can build cohesive systems. You can kind of snap these little bricks together and compose different things. Um, well, I, the example we just saw, and this is really contrived, but um, you just do an enumerable 2s, and if it responded to the each method and took a block, then it would work with this method, whether it's an array or a hash or a set or anything that is enumerable that has the each method, then it would work with it. And as you, in Ruby, as you start building these protocols, you start laying bricks in place, you start conforming to the protocols of other objects for interaction. And so you have those that can come down and as you conform to more and more of the protocol, then you have other objects that you can begin to interact with in a meaningful way. Or you could build your, um, your object protocols like this. <laughs> okay, we're done with that. Um, and Ruby's object model favors composition that way, whereas in a lot of object models, um, your thought process is centered around uh, inheritance and building classes up that way. Ruby is more about uh, composing classes of modules and building up um, from the ground up rather than top down. So since they're defined by behavior, um, I thought we'd discuss the behavior um, and what you can do with it and make some really interesting code. Um, open classes and module composition are really, really powerful mechanics if you take hold of them and, and really use them. Um, this is not a very good use of open classes, but it is one that demonstrates the point. Um, you can open the class string up and just slap a method in there. If you've ever looked in active support, they do this a lot for various things, various classes. There's a huge library of really actually helpful methods in there. I am not against this sort of patching so long as it's documented and everyone knows about it and it doesn't change behavior but only adds it. Then that's when you use something like this. Um, you could also do something like this. This is a very common idiom for plugins when they're adding uh, methods and behavior to active record. They will create a module, put all their stuff in there um, and then use send to tell active record base or whatever to include it. Now, that's a really good thing to use, but in most cases it can be really bad too, especially if you're distributing this code to other people because they may not know about the behavior you either changed or added, or they may have their own behavior that's similar to yours or whatever. And so, Ruby's object model is, is kind of set up to let you change a single object's behavior. Um, David Black is a big fan of this one, and uh, his chapter 13 of his book has been really helpful in making me understand this. Um, you thought when I talked about reaching for uh, altering a single object's behavior, I was going to go for instance eval, didn't you? Who thought instance eval when I said that? Okay, not a single person, so that's not as offensive. But, uh, it's actually really good. The singleton classes can actually give you a little bit 
more flexibility, and they definitely perform better. I did some benchmarks today that were kind of um, stressing the limits of this stuff, and using a single cl singleton class rather than instance eval just to add behavior was about five to 10 times faster than doing a lot of instance evaluation. And you've seen this singleton class thing before. You've seen class bracket or angle angle bracket self, um, and then adding things like that to add class methods. It's the same thing. Since classes are objects in Ruby, what you're doing there is you're saying inside this class body, self is the, the class object. And so this class less than, less than idiom um, adds behavior to that object. And so when you do that, you're adding a method to that class. You can do this with normal objects also. You don't have to do it with just class objects. Um, we have a string, and I add the pandamania method to the string, and then I call it just on that string, but if I create a new string and call it, it doesn't know about that method because that singleton class hasn't been created for that object. And I talk about you know, not really advocating instance eval. It's great, I use it. If you look at my code, I actually use it quite a bit because there are, are some situations where it's kind of essential, but I don't really advocate it. But if you really need to use it, you can. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, Ruby's really dynamic. Its objects are obviously dynamic as we discussed. David Black says saying Ruby is dynamic is kind of like saying Ruby is Ruby. Um, they're sort of one and the same. And it's really conducive in the way it operates to doing a lot of dynamic programming. I've um, talked about extending objects, um, the open classes, just being, the to being able to totally manipulate classes and the class objects at runtime. And there's also dynamic duck typing. It's not really the same thing with the same sort of idea where you have classes of, you know, here are three types, foobar and baz, and they all respond to the speak method, and I'm using all three of them in the same bit of code rather than having to write new methods for each one of them. As I said, your code could be dynamic using all the eval methods. You know, I, I'm talking like Zig Ziglar dynamic. Um, seriously dynamic here. Um, at this point, the Ruby interpreter acts as glue. I mean, you're not really um, dealing with something that's like telling you how to operate your code. It's just sort of the space that you can operate in and totally change the way anything operates, evaluate code on the fly, change the way individual objects, individual classes operate. It's just sort of this glue that sort of glues your object interactions together. Now the eval family of methods can be really useful if you're not familiar with them. Um, there's class eval, which adds behavior to a certain class. And so um, I've added some behavior to the thing class here. And it, um, when I run the make shiny method, then it adds a method that is shiny and it returns uh, true if it's defined. There's also module eval, which is its aliased and less attractive cousin. Um, and then there's instance eval, which I discussed before, that lets you alter a single object. In this case, I went back to the object that did not have an is shiny method and added it back in there, returning false, since that is, in fact, not a shiny thing. Just uh, don't abuse them. If I see code like this in anyone's open source repository, I may become very angry and be prone to throw things, like your house. And um, I will abuse you if you abuse these methods. And I will call this guy, and we will come to your house, and I'll let him rough you up and give you an inspirational talk about staying in school. Um, <laughs> but before we move further, we probably need to stop and talk a little bit about um, other methods that you can use. You don't necessarily have to use instance eval most of the time. Um, there are a lot of methods on object, on kernel, on um, class, on module that let you do the same kind of things without actually using instance or class eval. Um, you can't do everything with these, but you can do some things. And I, I sort of advocate doing that because it makes it clearer. Um, like there's define method that lets you obviously define a method. But if you do it in instance eval, you kind of have to parse the code, think about what you're doing, backtrack, figure out if that's the right thing to do. If you have define method or instance variable set, then it makes a lot more sense to be using that if that's all you're doing. And this is all kind of cool and 
sort of meta and everybody likes meta programming because you know it's a good resume bullet point and every web 2.0 company has that on their job listings these days but um, it's you know it's really practical also it's a really good way to save code and it's not one of these things where it's beautiful but you can't justify its existence it's like what what is that I don't even know <laughs> And then there are things that are just beautiful and self-destructive. And it's just kind of, I mean, it's sad to see. And then there are things that are beautiful and functional. If you've never sat in one of these chairs, go to your nearest Herman Miller dealer and just have a seat because they're heaven. And they're also $5,000. So if anyone wants to buy me one, I'll give you my book. That's how you get a copy. <laughs> And so they're really good at drying up code. Um, this is some code that's pretty similar to what I had in my Dcub utility. Um, it, it, and what Dcub does is it takes all of your modules and classes and stuff and um, it hooks into RDoc and just sort of surgically wedges itself in there and um, checks for uh, documentation coverage, just like RCOV tests for test coverage. And uh, this is some really stupidly written code that I had in there that, well, it's not really stupid. I mean, it made sense to me at the time, obviously. Um, modules, classes, and methods, I, I iterated, iterated each of those because they had a different method for getting their name. One was module name, one was class name, one was name, and so it made perfect sense. And then Chad Fowler uh, smacked me in the face. I really think he probably would have if we were in person. Um, and told me to refactor it this way. Um, the any class and any module are what our doc calls the class of module objects once they parsed it and gotten the documentation out. And so what I did is I opened those up, created a name method, and told it to return its class specific name method when it asked for a name. And so now I can do one loop instead of three separate ones. And plus the code makes just a lot more sense that way. And also make things pretty. There's gonna be a talk about that right after this one as far as I can tell. Uh, with domain specific languages. And, uh, you know, RSpec is a pretty good example of a domain specific language. It's not really English, as Dave Thomas said, it's just broken English if you try to make a DSL that's just pure English. And so um, this is a really nice language that is very domain specific. Someone who works in that domain is going to understand it really easily. And um, these sort of features of Ruby are what make that possible. You can change behavior without changing the class. Um, I like to call it munchy, monkeying without patching, or raping or punching, or whatever it is you kids call it these days. Um, this is just back to the per object behavior that I talked about earlier. Um, this is something that we do on a project that I'm working on now. Um, we have models, and that model is going to operate in a lot of different contexts. Um, it, this is interacting with a lot of different web services, and so instead of having eight different models or sending the model object off to a random method, um, we have these modules that encompass all the functionality we need to fully interact with that web service. And we, each time we interact with one of those, the different web services, we include the methods that we need to talk to them. So there may be like an upload method in every web service module that is included back into that model class each time on the individual object rather than the class and um, executed rather than having a bunch of different um, methods in a monolithic class floating around. It's also good for object composition, and you don't really hear that term a lot in Ruby, but when you do things like validations, um, things like axis attachment or attachment foo, um, these little metaprogrammed helpers, when they're used the right way, are a really nice way to compose your object's behavior without abusing the system. Um, that's really about it. I wanted to leave a lot of time open for questions because I heard a lot of people talking about how some of the stuff covered in Giles' talk was a little bit over their head or they had some questions about some of this. So, um, yeah, that was fancy. That's keynote right there. Um, so if anyone has any questions. Yeah. So if you're going to get into this later or if you don't want to slow the rest of the class down, you're welcome to skip over this question. Um, you mentioned uh, don't use instance eval or send, uh, you know, favor the, the singleton class. Yeah. Why? Um, well, like I said, it's a lot slower. And the problem with instance eval is a lot of times people like to go crazy with it. 
And there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's just in most situations you don't need it. If you're just doing some constant behavior, like, um, like enumerable, there's no reason to use instance eval for that, and I don't think they do. But you're adding each and next and first and all that to the class, and so since you're not having any sort of dynamic names, um, in Rails it makes sense because you know has uh, or find or create by those are dynamically created methods that they instance eval because it's find or create by name, and so you wouldn't want to go through all the attributes and pick all these names out and define all those methods. Um, it just makes sense to instance eval it. So in general, the singleton class makes more sense, but in some cases, it makes more sense to instance eval. Does instance eval, eval at the cost of speed, does it give you more flexibility? Yeah. Okay. You can inject, um, since you can use a string of code, you can put your own values in there, like the find or create by name. It's find or create by substitution, you know, whatever the property that you're looking for is. And then. Anyone else? Nobody? Okay. That's all I have. I was hoping for more questions, but that's okay. Uh, can you give us a demo? Uh, what? Anything. Start coding something. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, if you use uh, depth on an object, like depth, my object dot method name, um, is that any different than? Uh, no, it's just the same idea. Okay. Yeah, I didn't show that that in there, but it's the same idea. Um, it's still adding the behavior to that certain object, and it's the same thing if you do it with a class too. Do you know if it's optimized like uh, the way you're doing this uh, uh, class? I don't know. I haven't benchmarked that. Class. What kind of stuff in my talk was over? <laughs> I noticed like you guys were saying that space melts would be awesome. And, uh, oh, thank you. Mind okay. Yeah, it was a lot of high level meta programming kind of stuff, so. But that, that would indicate they understood it, right? No? No. <laughs> so it was, it was, yeah, there was a certain level of knowledge that was, they expected, I think, going into that talk, and I really enjoyed it, but. Yeah. Um, just for someone getting into this, what do you have any books you this uh, the new Black, the one chapter is really good. Um, I don't have the new pickaxe. I don't know if they probably updated that and had a lot of content in that area since it's sort of become more interesting since Rails has exploited every possible avenue for that sort of behavior. Um, I don't really know. If anyone's looked at the beta for the third edition, they might be able to speak to that. But it's still, it's still a pretty flat shot there. That one chapter is just excellent. Yeah. The, the technique where you uh, where you inject simple methods into particular objects. Mm -hmm. um, you show towards the end there. I I run into some cases where that can cause serious grief. And I don't know if it's a bug in Ruby or if it's defined behavior. But when you when you have a, a case statement that discriminates on the class of the, of the object. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes it gets confused and you can't call what class it is if you yeah. have modified the singleton class. Yeah, the singleton is. It, 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 it creates like a weird singleton inner class kind of thing, and it's not the same. David Black talks about that in, in his book, and he says that you know it's going to show up in ancestors, so that might be like a good way to balance it out, like merge the class name with the ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. The, the workaround you see in a, in a couple of places is that it discriminates on the class name, so the right. class class name, yeah. Yeah. and then the, just the string correction, which is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of weird, but I guess it makes total sense when you really think about how it's operating. But. Black book that's uh, Ruby for Rails? Yes. Yeah. The one with the guy with the hat? Yeah, the guy with the hat, which I'm real jealous of. My new customer, so. And he's updating that, by the way. Um, working on it for 1.9, so in case you were interested. 
Any more questions? Yeah. Thumb wrestle for a book? I'll just give you one. I have genetically weak joints, so okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Yeah. What other kind of benchmark can you talk about? Any other kind of flow? Um, alias method chain is Satan. <laughs> alias method chain is Satan. And that, that's really about it. I mean, you can, you're going to have to benchmark your usage. Um, it, when it comes to performance and this sort of stuff, you're kind of killing it off anyhow because you're doing a lot of weird dynamic stuff. And so you shouldn't look for like you know Ruby inline performance, but the difference between instance eval and the singleton uh, injection is is pretty significant. Um, outside of that, I don't really know. As long as you, you know, stay within the eval family of methods, the performance is going to be pretty flat. And once you get outside of that and you start talking to singleton classes, then the performance is going to be fairly flat. Um, and depending on what you're doing, you know one may actually be better than the other, but. Um, that's really all. You just kind of have to evaluate your, your special case and then work from there. Yeah? So when you use extend on instance to uh, say add behavior to that particular instance, are you creating a new meta class for every single object that you do that on? Um, when you're getting it's like extend and include and all that, I don't think you are. Yeah. Uh, are you creating? Yeah. It? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Class. okay. I can do that. So yeah. So I should probably worry about like uh, code generate like. Right. Yeah. Usage. You need a lot of extra. Yeah. Crop. And that's if you're doing like you know, ten thousand of them in one method, that may not be a good uh, a good way to go. But if you're doing it just once or twice, and you're letting the big architecture kick in and kick those out, then. You should be okay. 